Amen. Thank you, Kathy. I appreciate your ministry and your leadership. This is going to be a good day. Good morning. I have a question for you. Have, you. have you ever felt that your actions, that the way you behaved, maybe something you said, something you did, something you thought in your mind, something you thought about doing, maybe didn't do, was, was so bad, so ugly, and so disgraceful that you tried to hide from God? I know that I have. I, I know that I have. Uh, I spent three years running from God driving a truck from coast to coast in America. In 48 states, southern Canada, and northern Mexico, and guess what? God was in every one of those places. That's right. Praise the Lord. I'm glad he didn't give up on me. And I uh, hope that you feel the same as well for you. Has your actions ever affected the way that you feel about yourself? I mean, we, we can all put on a good face and say, well, how you doing today, brother? I'm doing fantastic. It's a good, God is good. God is good. And in the inside, you're a mess. You're, you're sad. You're, you're, you're hurting. You feel ugly and dirty. But the Holy Spirit's in you, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not ugly and dirty. But you feel that way. Isn't it funny how sometimes we get caught up in our feelings and we begin to act out of our feelings and not out of the reality of what we know to be true? It happens. It happens to all of us. That's what the devil does the best. He, he creates confusion even inside of ourselves. And we know in our cognitive mind that Jesus is Lord. I'm born again, full of the Holy Spirit, full of the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to live forever. And God has forgiven me of all my sins, past, present, and future. Amen. Amen. But there's this peace inside of me that just feels like garbage. You know what I'm talking about? I know what I'm talking about. I mean, I've been there. I've been there myself more than um, I want to spend time talking about today. But today we are going to talk about sin. And that's not a very popular subject. It's not a very popular subject for preachers either. Preachers don't mind preaching about sin because they end up having to look in a mirror in their own face and be, end up having to be repentant just like everybody else does. And I praise the Lord for, for God's faithfulness. Um, but specifically today, we're going to talk about the first sin. Theologically, we call that the fall of man. I was kind of, when I was a young Christian, young believer, I was pointing out the fact that I'm reading about the fall of man, and there was Adam and Eve in the garden, and Adam, uh, Eve ate the fruit. So why is it the fall of woman? We're going to talk about that today, too, as a matter of fact, because it should not be. It ought not be. It's the fall of man. That's what we're talking about today. We're talking about things today that perhaps may make us a little uncomfortable. Um, but there's an elephant in the room, and it's called sin. I want you to hear me say this. Everybody has a sin problem, whether you're a Christian or not, whether you're a born-again believer or not. Everybody has a sin problem. And theologically, because we all flow from the, 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 the stream of Adam, the DNA of Adam, the first man, and Eve, the first woman, in our, sin is in our DNA. We cannot escape sin. But those of you who may want to argue with me uh, theologically, that's fine. This is my question to you. Have you ever done anything to go against God's word? You sin. You have a sin problem. Jesus is the only answer to your sin problem. And let me be more specific. The, the, the resurrected king who came down from heaven, put on flesh, walked a perfect life on this earth, willingly went to the cross, was crucified for you, dead, buried, three days later, resurrected from the dead. That's the answer to your sin problem. Yep. May I go one more step, if you don't mind? You have a, a cognitive understanding of that historical reality 
is really great, but it will not save you. There's no salvation in cognitive knowledge. You need to be able to understand that this Jesus came and he died for you. He was, he was buried in the grave, took your place for you. And he was resurrected from the dead. He was born again, if you will, for you. For you. If you don't believe it was for you, you may not be saved. You need to hear that. A cognitive ascent to the knowledge of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is really, really great and good. The devil knows the same thing even more than you do. He ain't saved. But when you and I begin to walk in the truth and reality and the power and the knowledge of the experience of being born again and knowing that he did all those things for me, that changes everything. Amen. That changes everything. Jesus loves you. I know that he loves you because his word says so. I know that he loves you because he paid the price to have relationship with you. Yes. With you and with you and with you and with me. This you right here too. Rise above the mental ascent. There, I mean, there's little, no, remember when Jesus said, depart for I never knew you? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why he said that. Because people were had all this religious knowledge of who he is, but they had no relationship. Relationship comes through redemption, and redemption comes through repentance. That's the order. It has to happen that way. If you have not experienced that in your life, I pray that today is your day. That you will experience rising above the mental ascent to a historical knowledge of Jesus and having a personal relationship with him. And you can tell him so and so face to face, I love you because you love me first. And I'm so thankful that we can be together forever. Maybe today's your day. I hope that it is. I hope that it is. Let me get back to my notes. So let's have a, 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 a real basic understanding of what sin is. Sin isn't merely breaking a rule or uh, misbehaving or making a bad choice. It's, it's so much more than that. Sin, listen, sin is anything that contradicts God's holiness. Mm -hmm. Sin is anything that contradicts God's holiness. That thing in your mind right now, that. that now, that. It's not very difficult for a sinful, imperfect human being to contradict God's holiness. It ain't hard. And when you realize how easy it really is, <laughs> you should spend the rest of your life just praising the Lord because his blood's covered you of that. Hallelujah. Amen. Hey, man, that's good stuff. So you and I, we have a sin problem, all of us. And the only answer is Jesus. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son so that none would perish. God loves you so much, he gave us Jesus to pay the price for our sins. And the price of sin is death. Yes. Amen. Someone's going to die for your sin. God sent Jesus, receive it by faith and believe it and know that it's for you. So how did all this happen? How did we get to the place that we're at? Let me read some Bible to you if you don't mind. It's not up there yet. You know the story. It's familiar to you. Just let me read to you. May I? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Genesis chapter 3. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Don't. It says in my notes, keep the commentary down to a minimum. <laughs> I won't work really hard to do that. He said to the, what did he say to the woman? Did God really say that? And isn't that a very interesting question? Who came first, Adam or Eve? And didn't, didn't the father lay out, lay out, these are the boundaries and these are the freedoms and this is what I have for you, son. Just be obedient, Adam. Oh, and here's your wife. Take care of her too. I've always found to be rather amazing that when, when, when Eve came about, 
that Satan came to Eve first. And there's a lot of discussion about that. But this is one thing that I believe. I got my thing hanging down thing right there. This is the one thing that I believe. Men, men, I'm looking at you too. When you and I get, just get so distracted by the very idea of being a husband and a father and a masculine man involved in a heterosexual relationship, that we lose sight of the reality that God has given us a wife and children for us to care for, for us to teach, for us to lead. Amen. Things like this happen. Satan will come to the woman and say, and she'll, he'll say, did God really say that? And You know, I don't really know. Uh, maybe, I, I don't know. I'm paraphrasing here. Men, listen to me. Listen to me. Lead your wives. Lead your children. Not lord over them. Not, not, not beat them up with a Bible. Lead them with love and tenderness and respect and lead them to a place of acknowledging the power and the presence of God's word and that it's important. Listen, moms and dads of little kids, your children do not get to grow up and make their own decisions. If they grow up and make their own decisions, their decision will be to leave the faith. Mm -hmm. You need to see the math on that? You grow them up, lead, train them up as they shall go, and they will follow. That's right. Fact, it takes time. It takes patience. It takes an understanding of your responsibility and roles as a dad and a mom to lead your kids, husbands to lead your wives. And those of you who are unmarried, Jesus will lead you. Because every single one of us is the bride of Christ. Amen? Amen. He will lead you. It is so valiantly important. I, I got to tell you the truth. If, if mom and dad comes up to me and we're talking about a family dynamic that's a problem and, 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 uh, uh, and they say, well, we're just letting our kids make their own choices. They, they get to choose and they get to choose however they want to walk. And you better don't. I think it's Texan. I think I just said something Texan. Sorry about that. <laughs> Forgive me. But you better, you really better don't. Because they will follow their flesh every single time. How do you know that's true? Some of y'all did the same thing yourselves. Yeah. I did. I'm mean, even guilty of that with my own, my own bio family, my kids, my kids. And it'll leave them properly. Price to be paid for that. It's the same commentary at a minimum. Okay, I'm going to keep moving. And he said to the woman, as God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. You don't have to add to God's word. You don't have to add one dot or tittle or iota to God's word. God's word is quite sufficient. As soon as Eve started doing that, he, he, as soon as Eve misquoted God's word, he opened up a space for the serpent, Satan, the evil one, your adversary, to sneak in and just rumble up her thinking. Mm -hmm. She said it very well. God has set boundaries for us. Over here, have a great time. Over here, do not touch. And she changed the word. She didn't call it right. She didn't get it right. That's Adam's fault. So whenever you hear me teaching about Adam, the Adam and Eve, the creation story of men, I almost always say Eve and your dumb husband, Adam. Because if, if, if Adam would have stepped up and said, whoa, wait a minute. This is my wife. You need to talk to me before you talk to her, Mr. Beautiful Snake Guy. And why you're talking because you're a snake, I don't even know. <laughs> I, I mean, the, the garden was so awesome, a talking snake was no big deal. That was awesome. Anyways, I don't want to get stuck there. Adam should have stood up. And, Men, your wives are fragile and they're lovely and they're beautiful. But they're, but they're fragile. You, from time to time, may need to step up and protect your wife. Not because she's not capable of taking care of herself. Because God has called you to do that. Amen. And, he, and for me, my wife is very strong-willed. She's very smart. 
She's very intelligent. She's quite capable of caring for herself. But sometimes she needs me to step in and say, you know what? This is not happening anymore. This is, this is, we're done here. Or, or to even, even immediately correct the situation because I love my wife, but I'm called to do that. She's a gift and she's precious. And your wife is a gift and she's precious. Why? Sometimes you do the same things for your kids. In love, with respect. But when the kid comes home with a black eye, they need protection. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't need to run and give that other kid a black eye. Well, you gave my kid a black eye. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about that. But I am talking about addressing that kid's hurt. And addressing that kid's hurt. And that kid needs to know that you, as a mom or a dad, will protect them right. no matter what. Yep. You'll protect them. Keep commentary at a minimum. <laughs> Golly, I'm not doing a good job here. For the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. And keep moving. For, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. That's the background. That's the background. Um, throwing self-control here. When, when the world comes across with you with a message that contradicts the veracity of the Bible, the world is a liar. The world is a liar. When, when, when popular culture, music, movies, literature, whatever, magazines, whatever, comes at you with something that's false and, and contradicts God's word, you need to flee from evil. And by the way, I just had this thought. Paul teaches us many times in the New Testament, and so does Peter, to stand up and do, just put on the armor, get defensive. But when it comes to sin, especially sexual sin, he says flee. You know why? Because bi biology wins 100% of the time. Biology wins 100% of the time. When it comes to someone that's contradicting God's word, flee. Mm -hmm. Just flee. I and mean, if you're a theologian and you're strong in God's word and you have the ability to, to be a, a, an apologetic missionary, an apologetic prophet in this horrible world, you stand up and you duke it out. But if you don't flee, someone else will take up the fight. You feeling what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And let me tell you how you flee, just so you don't know. Click. 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 Internet disconnect. That's how you flee. This is the mistake we made. Because we're having this conversation. God really say that? Well, I can walk up this far and go no further and I'll be okay. We've all done that, right? Especially with number six. I'm a guy. I know what it means to be a guy. I will go this far and I will go no further. This is the boundary. This is the boundary. From this tree, I shall not eat. And as we're walking up, you're close to the tree. Man, that tree looks good. It's good enough to eat. And you take that next step. And then you're done. Yep. But you're not really done because of grace. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. But you're going to suffer. You're going to struggle. This is not about boundaries. Here we go. I didn't do too bad. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Dumb husband. Yeah. Remember those? Remember from a few weeks ago we talked about lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. There it is. Huh? It's laid out. I mean, there it is. It's just bigger in Dallas, and I've been to Dallas. It's pretty big. Did you know in Dallas they've got an interchange that's five levels high? Yep. It's incredible. It's the stupidest thing I've ever seen, but it's quite beautiful to look at from above. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, this is how this went. Listen, this this is very important. Did God say, yes, God said da 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 Did God really say that? The seed of doubt has been planted 
because her husband didn't teach her. And now she's acting off what the, the, uh, the, the, the doubt was implanted in her mind. And she's acting off of her feelings, her sensual f- her flesh. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh, that it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and desirable to make one wise, pride of life, she took of its fruit and ate. What's the problem with that? This is the problem. God did not provide that for her. So instead of going off, this is what we do. I mean, it looks good. Feels good. This will make me look good in my, in my, in my, in my, in my work or my job or in, in the marketplace or in my family. This will make it look, it feel, it, and we're operating out of our feelings. And the very first question you and I need to ask ourselves is, what does God say about this? And let that be the final thought. You see the difference? What God said, well, I plant a seed because it's what Satan does. And not, I have nothing to operate on except for my own flesh. They don't work. I mean, you know this as well, probably better than I do. So, Satan tempted, and then what he showed her was everything that we think is required to give us joy. And he offered it food. Uh, sexual expressions with, 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 the, with the mind and with the eyes with regards to food and, and fruit and whatever the case may be. Those, uh, those are the things that's been all presented before. We've all done the very same thing at a different level. Keep her moving. I got to write that in my notes. I, I, I can't because there's so much richness here. So much stuff. I, I, I haven't got to my point yet. I need to make some points here. Have mercy. Then, this is just 3, 7 through 8, then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife his, uh, his, themse- hid, it should be hid. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Sin. Is so destructive. Yes. It not only destroys our eternal relationship with God, but sin also damages every one of our relationships in this life. Yes. Today we're going to look at how sin affects these three things, and I'm going to try and just stick to these three things. Attitude towards ourselves, attitude towards God, and attitude towards others. We know my note taking friends. First, attitude towards ourselves. First, number one, creation, Adam and Eve, became aware of conscience. So, some say, I think mistakenly, that conscience is the voice of God mm-hmm. or the proof of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. To be honest, I'm not sure. I don't see a lot of scripture for that. But people think that. Let me ask this question. Have you ever listened to your conscience and things still go bad? <laughs> May I just press it a little further? Have you ever confused your conscience with lust? And said, well, this must be good. We're in love. We're going to get married. Or, or this food, I'm not, I, I know I don't need it because my doctor said my cholesterol is through the roof, but it looks good. Nobody, but your conscience will lie to you because it flows from an evil heart. Yes. It flows from a damaged mind. Amen. You can't trust your conscience. No more you can trust your flesh. That's not in my nose, but we'll keep moving. But what conscience does, this is what conscience does. And conscience is a real thing, but it's not a godly thing. What conscience does is it creates a moral sense of right and wrong. And whenever we start operating in a moral sense of right and wrong, you and I begin to become motivated by guilt and by shame. Do I need to say that again? Whenever you and I begin to be motivated by what we think is right or wrong, we are beginning motivated by guilt and shame. How many of you know that God is not in the business of handing out guilt and shame cards to you and I? No, that's, that's Satan's job. That's the devil's job. If you feel guilty, if you feel ashamed, if, if you did something wrong, and you feel guilty, and you feel guilty because you did something wrong, you need to repent. I did something wrong, repent. 
I'm not saying guilt is a false thing, but I am saying if you live there over and over and over and again, it's manipulation by the evil one. It creates a moral sense of right and wrong. That's not God. Because God says, look to my son. Look to the word of God and do what it says and repent and, and be healed and keep moving. We've all experienced that same that feeling. We've been at that place. We've had that experience. It's not a feeling. It's a reality. But we've also, also been in the place where, well, we have done something that we feel so tragically, terribly wrong that really God can never forgive me of that. And I'm going to repent from it because the Bible tells me to. It's a good religious thing to do because it's a moral thing to do. But I'm going to spend the rest of my life feeling like garbage. That's not God. That's not God. God has called you to freedom and power and victory over sin. The, the grave is empty so you can be free. Amen. Don't waste Amen. the grace. Don't, don't, don't. So, the, the conscience begins this evil ethic, ethic that what we do is more important than who we are. What we do is more important than who we are. That's, that's not Bible. That we must do right in order to be right. Your works count more than grace. That's what that's what that's how that ends up. It ends up that 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 we feel incorrectly that my works, what I do, is more important than who I am. How I behave is more important than the reality that I'm a, I'm born again, uh, son of God, grafted into the family with a mansion waiting for me in heaven. I've been forgiven of my sin, and I can live in freedom from all of that. Amen. That's who we are. What you do can never be more important than who you are if you're, if you're born again. If you're, a son, if you're a son or daughter of God, of the king. I've been stripping here in this voice. I can hear it already. Um, it creates this stifling bondage of perfectionism and control, which creates fear. I'm going to say that real slow. This ethic, this moralism creates this stifling bondage of perfectionism. Amen. Did God call any of you to be perfect? No. He did not. But we get caught in this trap. I have to be perfect. I have to prove my worth. I have to prove my value over and over again. And every time I make a mistake, which you do, which I do often, me probably more often than you, I get thrown back three steps and got to start the process all over again of, instead of just relying on the presence of the Holy Spirit and knowing that God's word says I am being perfected until that day. It's not about what you do, it's about who you are. Amen. Traction? Yeah. Y'all yeah. tracking with me? Good. I mean, that, that's so important for us to know, but it's, it's a brand new idea because we've been grown up in this religious culture, in this religious society that says, I have to be good in order to be right. You have to have faith in order to be right. You're made righteous by your faith in Jesus Christ and Christ alone, period. And we'll keep moving. I could do that for days because I think it's so important. And I know that so many people that I love and I care about has not bought into that reality. They're still living in this religious cycle over and over and over again. I sin, I feel bad. I sin, I feel bad. I keep doing the same thing, whatever. And just, there's no freedom in that. That's not what God's called for us to be. If, even before God spoke, Adam, where are you? Where are you guys at? They <coughs> already knew that they had sinned. Yeah. And you and I know when we have sinned as well. There are sins of, of commission, sins of omission. Sometimes we sin and we don't know that we're sinning. I'm not talking about that. I mean, that's, there's enough that you know that you're doing that's wrong that we don't even have to have a conversation, right? I mean, we're all guilty. Everybody, right? Yes. I'm feeling really lonely over here. No. Okay. No? Okay. No. All right. Um, and look at verse 7. It says, it says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew that they were naked. They did not need anyone to tell them. They knew it themselves. Sin is a pollutant. Sin is a pollution. P pollution covers up with ugliness the beautiful parts of creation. That's what pollution does. 
It, it, it takes something that's clean and makes it dirty. Before they were naked, or were they? We'll get that in just a moment. But now they realize that they were naked and they felt shame and guilt for the first time. You see the correlation here? So, so guilt causes shame and we try to hide shame. I remember when I was a kid, I, I broke something. I don't even remember what it was. But I put it back together in such a way, I'm a little bitty dude, three or four years old, put it back together in such a way that from afar, it looked like it was fine. Was it just me? Y'all do this too? Mm -hmm. yep. And then when someone got close to it, it fell apart and they got blamed for it. I was the big brother. <laughs> we do this, but we do the same thing emotionally. We, we try to piece things back together, make things look like they're everything's a-okay, until someone gets really close and then it falls apart and bleh, all over somebody else. That was kind of gross. Sorry about that. I'm a little sorry, not that sorry. So then the both, eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. Every human bears the stain of sin on his or her soul. Every human bears the stain of sin on his or her soul. God did not put it there. It is the inevitable result of sin and shame that comes from breaking relationship with God. What can take away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can take away my stain? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus will cover your stains of sin. That's right. You need Jesus. You need Jesus more than you know. Some of you have been walking with Jesus for 30, 40, 50 years, and you still need Jesus more than you know. You're not going to understand the depth of your depravity, and you stand before the Father, and he lets you know how much his grace is. Oh, it's going to be a, that's why there's going to be a party in heaven. Because you know what could have happened, and then you know what's going to happen, and you're saying, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Amen. We need Jesus. We need Jesus badly. Listen. Adam and Eve tried vainly to cover their sin, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves a covering. I've read that a hundred times. And fig leaves? Really? Fig leaves are not very big. And I'm sure Adam and Eve didn't have a weight problem. They probably, whatever, normal, what, if they were first the first creed, what do you know? But fig leaves? And how did they sew them together? I mean, Adam and Eve had never thought about needing covering before. And then look, oh, Adam, we're naked. We need to sew some fig leaves together. The Bible said they did it. They did it. I'm not doubting that. But I don't know how that process went in their thinking. Hey, I know what. I'll grab a fish bone and some spider thread web stuff, and we'll sew this together, and we'll put it on as if you just write down a little more. Perfect. I don't know. And, 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 and I, another question is this. I had this question. I'm writing this sermon. I had these silly thoughts in my head. I wonder if before the fall that allergies were not a thing. Contact dermatitis, not part of the process. Until she ate the apple, and all of a sudden sin comes in, and I believe disease is a result of sin. Yes. They were using, they're covering up their naked parts with fig leaves. I hope contact dermatitis had not kicked in yet. Because that'd be very uncomfortable. That'd be a bad thing. I mean, I, I want to rub my skin with my fingernails, and I don't know why, but it's really terrible. <laughs> they sewed together fig leaves to cover the, to, to, to make themselves coverings. Before, before they had sinned, they did not need coverings. Why? I believe. I don't have Bible for this, but I believe that what they were covered with before was the glory of God. That's what I believe. Can you imagine just for a second? <laughs> hey, Adam, how you doing? I'm doing great. I need a helper. Take a nap. Boy, I got something for you. <laughs> and she stands up, and Adam just goes, wow. That was his first word to his wife was, wow. Because I know she was stunningly beautiful to his eyes. God created her to be beautiful to her husband. 
And they were covered with the, in the glory of God, with the light of God shining around them. So when they saw one another, they saw the presence of their father. <laughs> I wish my marriage was like that all the time. <laughs> because it's true. When I look at my wife, when you look at your husband or your wife, you should see who she is. She's the son or daughter of a king. You should understand her positioning through the glory of God that is revealed through your marriage. I don't always see her that way. I'm sure she doesn't always see me that way. But I, I want to see her that way more and more all the time. I keep moving. So, so because of sin, the glory of God had to be removed. God cannot be in the same place as sin. Yeah. You understand that. I mean, grace is grace and grace is good. Uncovered, unconfessed, unrepented, undealt with sin, you remove the glory. That's why Jesus is so important because Jesus is a the glory, the presence of the Holy Spirit is the glory of God inside of us. We are in him and he is, up. He is in us. Praise him. Praise God. That's just great news. I love that. So, so um, they suddenly knew that they were naked. And this is the other thing about being naked. When I was in college, I had to give my first talk in front of my classroom. And I had the dream. You know the dream, right? The dream was, well, for me, my dream was that I was just standing there in front of the classroom just in my, in my BBDs and my tidy whities It just wasn't an attractive sight. No one needs to see that. But, I, but because it, I was afraid, and that's, that's how being exposed really feels. Some of you have had the same dream, and you were naked because, we don't, because we're feeling very vulnerable. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, they wagged their fingers and shook their tongues at his exposure. No one wants to be exposed. Every single one, well, many of us have experienced uh, something we did that was wrong, naughty, however you want to put that, and we're trying to keep it secret, and then all of a sudden, it's found out, and you're exposed, and you're feeling very exposed, and you, you just want to run and you want to hide. I understand how Adam and Eve felt. In Jesus, he took the exposure for you on the cross. The sin and the shame and the exposure. Praise God. God loves you. That's right. God loves you. Adam and Eve's vain attempt to correct or hide the problem of their sin shows that the works of their hands is insufficient. Adam, Eve, I, I don't know what just happened, but that shiny thing is not around you anymore. And I'm seeing you for exactly who you are now, a sinner. We can't let God see us like this. We can't. So here's some fig leaves. Thank you, church. And, and, and we should be okay. He may not even notice. <laughs> Guilty, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. if, if I can work really hard to cover up the effects of my sin, he might not even notice. Yeah. Do you have any cat people in here? I know there's one at least. Uh, another cat person over here. I pray for y'all. I, I don't understand. I love y'all. I love y'all very much. But cats are weird. <laughs> these, these little furry mammals, they have the box with the sand in it. This never happened to you. They go to the litter box and they're doing what they got to do. They're looking at you. <laughs> they're just looking at you like, what, bro? And then when they're done, as nonchalant as a cat is, they just cover it up. Use the back legs. Inevitably, the sand flies out of the box. Yeah. Not cool cats. But that, that, should, that should stay in the box. We don't want that. But they look at you like nothing's wrong. And they just cover it up like it would never happen, like it wasn't there. And then every 12 hours or so, you, as a dutiful cat owner, take the cat scoop, and you begin the searching for the wrong things that he did. And then you dig it out and you throw it away. Sin's the same way. Sometimes we try to cover it up and hope nobody else sees it. Or even in the middle of sin, people are looking at us, you're like, bro, what? I'll just cover it up. I'll just keep moving. 
Like that never happened. Yeah, God knows. When God asked them, hey, where are y'all at? He didn't, wasn't asking for, uh, he did not need any information. I'm going to get that in just a second. <laughs> Secondly, attitudes towards God. Adam and Eve fled from the presence of God, and Adam and Eve falsely thought that they could hide from God. I got ahead of myself. That's okay. And they hid from the presence of the Lord. Adam, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Sin made a tremendous difference in their relationship in a very short time. Sin made a tremendous difference in the relationship with their creator, God, in a very, very short time. It went full-on fellowship, and the next thing you know, they're hiding in the bushes. That's what sin does. Full-on fellowship, hiding in the bushes. Been there. Before sin, they enjoyed the presence of the Lord, and after sin, they tried to hide. Listen, in rebellion, Sinners will try to hide and flee from the presence of God. Well, you know what, Pastor Skip? I just, I just don't believe anymore, so I'm, I'm leaving the church. Oh, well, what's going on? Oh, nothing. I just made an intellectual decision that I'm going to leave the church. I'm making an, an intellectual, logical. What do you need to confess, bro? Because <laughs> it's always something. It's, it's always something. Well, nothing. Well, no, no, that's not true. You. You have to sin. You've done something you feel like is so tragic and terrible that you feel like you're going to run away from God and leave the church and the sin problem goes away. What have you done? Well, I did A, B, C, X, Y, G. Well, you just need to pray about it. You just need to repent and receive his forgiveness and stay in the fellowship of the body of Christ and follow the lordship of Jesus and live your life and know that you've been saved. Sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. Thirdly, sin affects our attitudes towards other people. Sin affects all relationships. All. Underline. If you're taking notes on the keyboard thing, bold it and italicize it. Sin affects all relationships. Listen, people, my friends, my loving family whom I love so dearly. Whatever relationship you're thinking about right now, work relationship, parenting relationship, children's relationship with your parents above, your neighbors, people in your church, whatever situation, relationship you're thinking about now, if there is strife in the middle of that relationship where believers are involved, sin is involved. Fact. Lovingly. That's the whole Matthew 18 passage. That's what that's for, is to expose the sin. So that we can so that we confess one to another and receive forgiveness one to another so we can live free in our relationship. That's the whole point. It's not a pharisaical thing. Well, I know you did something wrong. What did you do? Well, you did that and da 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 and da 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 and I'm mad at you and we're gonna run you off or whatever the case may be. That's not the point. Sin affects relationships. If your relationship is struggling, look for the sin graciously, lovingly, with kindness. Because the word says to be kind to one another. Is that what the Bible says? Mm -hmm. Pretty clear. It's not it's emphatic. Be, be kind to one another. Look for the sin and deal with that. Often the saddest result of sin is its effect on others. Eve was not content to disobey God on her own. She included her husband. Hey man, I'm fixing to go and, and drink me some whiskey. Come with me. No, bro, I'm not going. No, no, come on, come on, come with me. And then when they, then you attack their character. Oh, you're just a scared sissy. You're just a this and you're just a that. You shame them into coming with you. And like a fool, you go with them. And the next thing you know, everybody's in trouble. Just me. Yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> it's so true. Uh, we often try to bring other people into our own immoral behavior. And then we try to blame others for our sinful choices. Adam blamed Eve, and then he blamed God. Yes. You gave me this woman. This is your fault. You. That's another sermon. I'm not even going to hang out there for very long. But you need to take responsibility for your own junk. <laughs> you need to clean up your own cat box. <laughs> I'm done with that metaphor. It's kind of gross. But you, need, you, do, you need to be responsible for your own stuff. 
you want to fix a relationship, I'm sorry I said what I said. I was out of line. I was wrong. I repent. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't forgive you. Well, I'm asking you to forgive me anyways. And when you can't forgive me, then we'll come back together. Or, or I, I did this thing. I, I, I did this act, and it, was, and it violated the, not only the rules of God, but our relationship as well. This is what I did. This is why I think I did it. What do you think? What is your input? Don't be afraid. What is your input? Love one another and be kind and work to the end of the problem because you and I, every one of us, have a sin problem. We need to be more gracious with the ones we're closest to. Amen. If we're at it, don't keep records. Don't keep records. Or you remember that thing you said three months ago? Oh, I still remember it. I'm still mad at you. What did I say? Don't do that. It's just kind of silly. Listen, this, this kind of life is blaming. It's not being accountable for. It's not sustainable. You need to repent and be saved. Receive Jesus. He has paid the price for your sins. And then you can truly forgive yourself. You understand. Listen. I'm going to step on some toes and do it in love. If you're living in a place and walking in a lifestyle where you are blaming yourself for circumstances that you had little or nothing to do with or that happened 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years ago, you need to get over it. Be you need to get over it. Not because, not because, not because what you're feeling is wrong, but it's, it is a violation of your faith. Do you understand? Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. you, need to, you need to forgive yourself and move on Amen. when it's time. I mean, there, there's a process to this. It doesn't just happen out of the blue. That's fake. This is ridiculous. Well, I'll, well, Jesus, forgive me. So I'm acting like nothing ever happened. No, I'm not talking about that. But I am talking about having real conversations with yourself and with your God. Let go of stuff. Even stuff you did that was wrong. You've been forgiven of it. It's not held against you by the creator of the universe. Why would you hold it against yourself? Excuse me for being rude, but who do you think you are? That's right. God says different. Go with God. Amen. Go with God. I'm trying to be compassionate. Scars are real. Pain is real. Mm -hmm. And this all really matters. And I'm not trying to downplay that, but I'm encouraging you by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the confession of your faith in Jesus Christ, the one who resurrected to save you, trust his word. You are forgiven. Be free. The devil says this. Did God really say that? <clears throat> well, I'm not sure. What I did was pretty bad. Mm -hmm. well, I'm not sure either then, bro. You're on your own for that. That's what the devil does. He keeps you down. He's a liar, and he hates you. The devil's a liar, and he hates you. The, what the devil does not want you to see, want to see in your life, is for you to live a life on this earth free from what he tried to start before. He doesn't want to see that. He doesn't want you to be free. He doesn't want you to be healthy or happy. He doesn't want you to be joyful and, and serving God with all of who you are, with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. He doesn't want to see that. He knows it's going to happen in the end, I think. I'm not sure. That's a weird eschatology position. I'm working that out. But the fact of the matter, he doesn't want to see it now. So he'll, he'll keep telling you, did God really say that? You know, you did that thing. Yeah. You, you, yeah. No, that's not of the Lord. You need to believe the word of God. Believe the faith in your, in your confession in him that you are saved and that you are set free from the, from the, from the sin. Here we go. Um, and lastly, this. I forgot to tell you at the beginning of the message. I'm going to spend a little bit of time grinding on you just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Kind of stepping in you, stepping on you, getting all up in your Kool-Aid. But I'm not going to leave you there. Y'all believe me? Yeah. Good. Also for Adam and his wife. The Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. This is so beautiful. The Lord God didn't tell Adam and Eve. You know, you guys, the, 
The glory is removed from you. You need to be concerned about contact dermatitis. The fig leaves may not be a good choice. Go skin a couple of rabbits and do what you got to do. He didn't do that. Look what it says. For Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin himself. He provided the means to cover up their shame. He provided the means to cover up their guilt. He did it because of love. Mm -hmm. He did it because of compassion. He did it not because of empathy or sympathy. They did it just for love. I love you. I have better for you than this. Let me take care of your sin. And he clothed them. God made something die to cover their sin. Amen. Blood was required. Yes. Death was required to deal with the sin of Adam and Eve. Death is required to deal with your sin and with my sin. And the one that God killed to cover my sin, his name is Jesus. Amen. He died so that your sin can be covered. He died so that you can be presentable towards sinless God with a sinless presence and a sinless self. That's what God did. He made tunics of skin. Listen. Worship team, you guys come up. Come on up. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem. This is Luke 19, chapter 10, verse 10. Because they, they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went far into a country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 emas, and said to them, do business till I come. But his citizens, uh, but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him. I'll tell you something beautiful there, my friend, Tom, uh, Bob. Thank you. I'm going to change gears here. Lord God sent his son to die for your sins. And over and over again in the scripture, it says that we must repent and to believe. And what must we believe? And our confession should be that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he was born of a virgin, that he died to pay the price for our sins, and he resurrected from the grave in three days, and he lives forever. And you know the cool thing is this? Even after, in, in the midst of all of this, of, of the post-Easter story, the post-Easter drama, if you will, we'll talk more about that in a few weeks, is that with, with Peter, his sin, and, and, and they scattered, and they left him all alone. To die the die of, 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 a, of, of a sinner, a thief, a murderer, a liar. Die the death on the cross that you and I deserve because of our sin. And when he came back, the first thing that he did is he made breakfast. <laughs> God's providing a way. He loves you. So listen, this morning as we continue, as we continue to sing, we are going to, I'm going to move this out of the way. And if you feel like you want to come up here and pray on your own or with somebody else, bring somebody with you. Pray where you're standing. But I want you to understand that the sin that some of you are carrying around, you do not have to carry it anymore because it does not belong to you. It's not yours. It's been dealt with on the cross. And I'm telling you, and I'm telling you with simple words, you need to believe Jesus. When he said it is finished, he was talking about you, and he was talking about me. So as we worship, the altars are open. Pray where you're at. Come see me. Go see somebody else. In the, in the, it is time for you to deal with whatever it is you need to do that the Lord has laid upon your heart right now. The Spirit is moving in this room. So let, let's worship. Sing for us a pretty song, my friend. The highest price ever.